Hello, and welcome to Becker's 18th Annual Spine, Orthopedic, and Pain Management-Driven ASC Virtual Conference. We are excited to have you join us for today's session, Preparing to Add Total Joints and Spine Procedures to Your Multi-Specialty ASC, sponsored by Mizuhu OSI. Before we introduce today's presenters, we would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. You'll also find a few other engagement tools on your dashboard. Be sure to check out our resources section and fill out the event survey. Finally, this session is being recorded and will be available on demand following today's event. We will send you instructions on how to access the on-demand recordings once today's event concludes. Today, we are joined by Monica Krellen, Director of Operations at Surgical Care Affiliates, Dr. Matt Rose, Orthopedic Surgeon with Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance, and Dr. Mahir Hawk, Spine Surgeon with Spine Group Orlando. At this time, it is our pleasure to turn the floor over to our first presenter, Monica Krellen, to begin the presentation. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, I would like to thank Beckers and Mizuho OSI for the opportunity to share some experience with you that I have around starting up a total joint program or, and or a spine program. So today, we'll, I'll give you a brief introduction, a little bit about me, and then we'll talk about some physical plant and clinical considerations and some business considerations around starting these service lines. A little bit about me. My name is Monica Krellen. I am Director of Operations with Surgical Care Affiliates here in San Diego. I have over 28 years experience in the ambulatory surgery space. And during that time, I have participated in the startup of three de novo uh, ASCs with a focus on orthopedics, spine, and total joints. And I currently support a region that includes six centers with orthopedic programs, five of those including total joint and spine programs. So I have a little bit of experience here. So to start off, we want to talk about some physical plant and clinical considerations when looking at these programs. One of those primary issues would be your SPD size and sterilizer capacity. There are a lot of instrument trays and things of that nature involved with doing these types of surgeries. So you want to consider, do you have the load capacity to be able to run these timely? Will the trays fit in your sterilizer? Um, things of that because it will determine how many cases you can do in a day or potentially even back-to-back -back days um, on how you can actually um, sterilize and process all those instruments. Another thing would be equipment, instrumentation, supplies, and storage. So one thing is specifically with equipment is what type of OR table do you have? Is it one that the surgeon likes? Are you going to have to invest here, for example, the um, Mizuho OSI trios table? Um, is one that you might consider looking at, or the HANA table for anterior approach hip surgeries. Do you have that, those tables specifically? And if you don't, one consideration that you will want to give serious um, attention to is the purchase of new versus used um, equipment in this area. Oftentimes, um, the appeal of used equipment is that it's a little less expensive, but you want to take into consideration where you're resourcing it from, and the fact that oftentimes repairs and maintenance on used equipment can catch up with you very quickly, um, and then you end up actually spending more in the long run than perhaps investing in newer equipment. So something that you want to consider there. Also, do you have an appropriate microscope for spine, like a Leica OH4, something of that nature? Um, you'll want to also look at um, supplies. There's a lot of supplies related to these types of cases, and are you going to try to get your physicians to consolidate to use similar disposables? And if not, do you have space to store all of this additional um, supply items in your um, sterile supply storage? And you'll want to make sure that you review with your surgeons um, items like power, uh, instrument trays, retractor trays, things like that, and do you have storage for all those additional types of, of trays? Um, also, OR size. Are your ORs minimum size? Are they larger? What does it feel like when you get all of this equipment into an, in, into an operating room? Is it going to be comfortable for the physician? Is it going to feel tight? You want to take that into consideration as well. Um, another key component is having a strong clinical team that includes a, your medical director and a physician champion around these service lines. 
Um, having an experienced, fully engaged, and competent um, clinical crew will provide a much um, smoother and satisfactory experience for the patient and the surgeon. And you want to make sure that your medical director, anesthesia, and your physician champion are on board and work with your team to create a patient, patient um, criteria for selection that's appropriate. You don't want to be having cases booked and then canceled because there were unexpected health issues or something that could be avoided by having um, an appropriate patient selection criteria. Um, then your PACU and 23-hour capacity. Do you do 23-hour stays now? Um, can your PACU accommodate 23-hour stays? Do you um, have the size and the number of beds? Um, how will your recovery be impacted by potentially um, having beds out of use for an entire day or the evening and into the next day? What does that look like? You'll want to actually also consider staffing around 23 hour. Um, do you have the staffing to accommodate that as well? And you'll want to make sure that you've checked with your accreditation requirements around adding the 23 hour capacity if it's not something you currently have. Um, speaking of policies, you want to make sure that you have appropriate policies and procedures in place. Um, a good, again, a good patient selection criteria and instructions for pre and post op around this. You'll want to make sure that they cover all the aspects related to spine and total, total joint surgery and that you have that written patient selection criteria that you can share with your op physician offices and that your nurse navigator also can use preoperatively and postoperatively to ensure best outcomes for the patient. Okay, moving on to some business considerations now. Um, the fun one is always payer contracts and payer mix. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that you're evaluating your payer contracts and the payer mix that you expect from the surgeons that are bringing cases to you to ensure that it's a sustainable program. Uh, are the CPT codes associated with these cases covered by your contracts? Um, you want to make sure that you do a comprehensive evaluation to see are they covered, what's the rate of reimbursement, and to remember that in most of these cases, it's going to require pre-authorization, so you want a very good relationship between your scheduling staff and the physician's office to ensure that requests for pre-auth are put in well in advance and obtained before surgery um, is completed. Also, are implants separately reimbursed under your contract or are they bundled? It's something that you definitely want to be paying attention to because reimbursement rate versus implant cost can very quickly create a negative revenue situation if they're not um, reimbursed separately. Then you want to look at does your center um, have payer contract negotiations done through support from an outside company? Are you a standalone? Do you do it yourself? Or are you supported by a managed care organization such as like FCA or USPI? Are you part of a health organization that helps with your contracting? And when was the last time your contract rates were negotiated? Was it two years ago? Was it last month? Um, that's something that you want to take into consideration and see do you need to go back and potentially look at carve-outs for these codes or enhanced reimbursement. Um, also, corporate support for supply and implant purchasing, do you have that? Is it something you're going to be negotiating on your own? Um, the disposables and implants, um, what you pay for that can make a very big difference to the success of the program and your bottom line. And vendor support, I highly recommend engaging with your vendors early and often around what these supplies and implants look like is from a cost perspective, from PAR levels, return policies, because all of that, again, feeds to a good, well-oiled program with a good bottom line. Now, some considerations around surgeons and staff. Um, the commitment of the providers to the facility will be key in this to this relationship. So I do recommend that you have some very frank and honest conversations up front with those providers to see what are they truly thinking they can migrate from where they are now over to your facility, what does that look like? You're looking for very uh, solid alignment between your providers and the facility to, you know, and their commitment to making this program work. Um, as far as providers versus uh, providers of stakeholders versus utilizers, are these partners in your center that are going to be coming over? Um, we do find that um, having shareholders as your primary providers here does create a more stable long-term program. Utilizers are wonderful as well, but at some point they may be looking for partnership. Is that something that you'll be able to offer? If not, they might look elsewhere. Um, so you just want to take all of these things that we just talked about into consideration to creating a, a really solid performa of what 
rolling out these service lines look like for your center. And that ties into the next one of winning over non-orthopedic stakeholders around this capital investment. This Performa that you put together um, provided that it shows that this program makes sound business sense, typically is the best way to win over your non-orthopedic stakeholders. It's to show them that you've invested the time and energy into what this looks like, the benefit to the center, and typically they'll come along. Um, staff training and support, this is an area I'm incredibly passionate about. If you are going to do this program, make sure that you allow time for appropriate training for your staff and give them the support that they need. They are your boots on the ground um, workers that support your physicians and care for your patients, and you absolutely want to make sure that they've had that training and the support to feel 100% comfortable engaging in these service lines. Um, also, um, the nurse navigator, the benefits of a nurse navigator, I did mention that earlier. That's a nurse on your team that's dedicated to streamlining the process and communication between the surgeon's office, the patient, the facility, and potentially a step-down recovery care facility as well. It ensures consistent education for patients, all of this which leads to excellent patient experiences and results. So it's a, it's a very critical key position. Competition, um, something unfortunately we always have to take into consideration when doing new things in our centers. So you'd want to look at how many other ASCs are in your geographical area offering these same services? How close are they in proximity to your center? And what's their reputation? What kind of a challenge potentially does this create for you? Also looking at are you affiliated with a hospital or a health system partner? And if so, do they support the addition of this service line into your center? Often hospitals rely heavily on these types of cases as part of their revenue stream, and it can become a bit of a pain point if cases are migrating out of the hospital into your center. So you just wanna be prepared for any pushback that you might get there. Also ASCs versus hospitals, um, it is potentially a safer environment from an infection prevention um, per uh, perspective, which creates improved outcomes. Um, versus hospitals, and the implementation of those ERAS protocols, the enhanced recovery after surgery, having things like pre-surgery hydration, potentially even pre-medicating with some non-narcotic medications, and getting patients up and moving quicker within 24 hours of surgery, um, as per the physician's instructions, creates that enhanced quicker recovery. And ultimately, typically ASCs are a smaller, more intimate environment, less intimidating, which creates a better patient and family experience overall. So at the end of the day, to wrap it all up, um, total joints and spine cases are completely safe to be done in the ASC environment. Even across the country, these case types are becoming predominantly same-day discharge surgeries with only an extended same-day recovery, not requiring the 23-hour option, but it's always great to have that. Exceptional outcomes are being achieved, and they're more cost-effective for patients in an ASC environment um, with their out-of-pocket expenses. But you want to be prepared to make the investment to set up your program, and that's both in equipment and staff time and education, checking like those things like CPT codes and contracts. So that investment is not just a financial investment. It is a time and energy invest investment into setting up a program that ultimately will be sustainable and successful. So I wish you all the, um, the very best in your endeavors um, to get these programs set up. And I am now gonna turn it over to Dr. Uh, Matt Rose for the next part of this program. Thank you so much. Great talk, Monica, thanks so much. Um... I'm going to be kind of talking about my experience and moving to outpatient total joints in a surgery center. And I want to give you a, a physician's perspective. Um, I'm going to talk on my next slide. Uh, let's see. So basically, the kind of outline of what I'm going to go through, um, kind of getting you to be able to do outpatient total joints in your surgery center. And I'm going to kind of go through the history of how we got to do outpatient total joints here, um, our decision to move to the surgery center, the planning, and then what our experience has been. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. So a little history about me. Uh, my name is Dr. Matt Rose. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm a general orthopedist with a focus on total joints. Uh, I started doing anterior total hips in 2010. 
Jonathan Erasmides kind of taught me, which was the irony. He was my junior resident in training at University of Louisville. And then once he got out, he was one of Joe Mata's first fellows. He kind of started stealing all my hips. So as a favor, he brought me in and taught me. And he is a big proponent of the HANA table. Uh, and so that's how I learned. I went to multiple uh, OSI courses uh, to kind of hone my skill as well as multiple revision courses, which if anybody hasn't done those, highly recommend them. Every time I go, I pick up some new pearl or tidbit. Um, I also started to do tourniquet list total knees in 2015, which was a game changer in terms of thigh pain and getting them up walking quicker. Uh, I went to press fit total knees in 2018, getting away from cement, uh, quicker OR times. Um, I do about 200 total knees uh, a year and about 150 total hips per year. Go to the next slide. So part of us, you know, is moving to just doing outpatient total joints. And at the time, we all kind of started looking at this. We got involved with the BPCI, which is the Bundled Payment Care Initiative by the government, as well as doing gain sharing with the hospital. And that really kind of honed our skill as orthopedists of being efficient, keeping the cost down, getting the patients out of the hospital quicker. Um, you know, we really unified our care amongst the orthopedic surgeons. We have about 35 joint surgeons within Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance, and we would get together and do kind of best practices and what we found worked and what we found didn't. And it went from everything to uh, wound closure, implants, what people were doing post-operatively, you know, limiting home health um, and kind of mainstreaming our care within the hospital. And we got to the point in the hospital where almost 95% of my total joints uh, in the hospital uh, were done as outpatient. They were going home the same day. Um, and, then, and then it became, you know, kind of an issue of insurance, you know, what are they going to do? How are they going to change? And we'll go to the next slide. So part of our things within the hospital that really kind of helped us uh, become outpatient total joints, part of it was through our TriStar HCA, which we developed uh, Enhanced Surgical Recovery or ESR. A lot of that was uh, patient education uh, with a total joint class, really giving them a lot of expectations before preoperative, during the surgery and post-operative, a lot of goal-directed fluid therapy, you know, not over-hydrating them, not under, you know, not getting them dehydrated, which shows increased pain. Uh, we use multimodal pain management uh, between uh, Neurontin, high dose, 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol, uh, Celebrex, 400 milligrams preoperatively, and then continuing those postoperatively. We would do a perioperative carb load as well as DREAM, which is drinking, eating, and early ambulation. Um, the anesthesia, mostly spinals, our total knees are uh, spinals with adductor canal blocks. Like I said, tourniquet list was great because their they're quads activating right away. We're not getting atrophy. Their strength's good. They're able to do a straight leg raise right away. Um, avoiding the IM canal, uh, we're going extramedullary on the tibia. Uh, still doing intramedullary, although in the hospital, some of us were using uh, navigation just to avoid the pain of intramedullary canal, uh, but it seems to be more associated with the kind of the tibial IM guide. Um, nursing, you have to have complete buy-in uh, to perform outpatient. It's kind of like a drop of oil and a tank of water will ruin it. If any one nurse tells a patient, wow, you're, you're going home today, that seems a little crazy, or somebody's not being bought in, if you can make the patient believe they walked into the hospital, they're going to walk out, and they will. Um, our physical therapy as well is immediate, uh, about an hour in recovery room, physical therapy would move them from the surgery bed to the bed that they would recover in. Uh, they would make them take a few steps, turn and pivot, uh, as well as being seen within a couple hours uh, once their foot sensation was back and getting them up, getting them moving quick. And that seemed to be very beneficial. Next slide. So now that we're doing it successfully in, in the hospital, um, you know, 
can we do it in an outpatient surgery center? You know, it, it, is insurance going to pay for it? At the time, Nashville, when I was going to some of the courses, people were already, do the, already doing them in surgery centers. However, in Tennessee, or at least in the Nashville region, that had not taken off yet. We were, everybody was doing outpatient in an inpatient facility, but nobody was doing it in surgery centers. So will the insurance pay for it? You know, can it be done safely and efficiently? We're also used to our routine where we can do seven or eight total joints and be home by two or three. Are we going to lose that efficiency and a surgical experience? You know, what's my experience going to be doing it with a different team? Um, you know, am I going to have to train the whole team how to do it? What's the patient's experience going to be? You know, it, kind of starting this in a surgery center, are they going to be, are they going to have the same pipeline feel that it's going to be, wow, this is a well-oiled machine. Everybody knows. Um, is the staff at the surgery center, do they want to take on uh, this as well as the cost for the, for the equipment? And there are some capital out by that Monica talked about early on that um, can affect that. So we'll go to the next slide uh, it, and talk about my center. So in our area, we're a CON state. So we couldn't just open up our own center, but we did already have existing centers in place where we do outpatient rotator cuffs, ACLs, carpal tunnels. The center that I perform at is one called Patient Partners. Uh, it's here in Hendersonville, Tennessee. It's 41% owned by USPI and Ascension, um, which is our hospital system, and then 49% physician owned. There's about uh, 13 physician owners. We have two ORs, and two endoscopy suites, so it's true multi-specialty. Um, that was a concern. Are we going to be doing total joints? And those patients are going to be near people that have had bowel preps uh, prior to their colonoscopies. Is that an issue? Um, we're mostly three orthopedic surgeons just added a foot and ankle, but we average about 330 total case orthopedic cases there a year. That's just between three orthopedic doctors do 330 total cases per year. Um, but without being able to open up a true just uh, an orthopedic only or total joint center, this was our kind of only option to do this. And so our biggest holdup was our insurance negotiation. And fortunately, it took us about a year uh, for Ascension to negotiate with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, to allow us to do this. And this started about three years ago. Um, and so once we kind of got a target price uh, that was acceptable, that was great, now it was kind of on to the next step. So move to the next slide. So, you know, part of the planning, once we kind of do this is somebody has to take the role. Um, and that was me at our facility. Um, you kind of have to meet, you kind of have to get a plan. You kind of have to lay out how this is going to happen. Um, get the team motivated. Um, our anesthesia, we were very lucky at our center. So our anesthesia, we have a large group in, in Nashville that covers all of our facilities uh, called AMG. So a lot of the providers that were doing our anesthesia at the hospital also rotate through the surgery center. So they were very comfortable from an anesthesia standpoint doing the spinals and doing the adductor canal blocks um, that we were doing in the hospital as well as fluid management, stuff of this nature. Um, we had to name somebody as a total joint care leader that kind of followed the patient uh, all the way through uh, from the preoperative to kind of the intraoperative day or day of surgery and postoperative that would call uh, and preoperatively would, you know, checking lab work, doing all the things to make sure that all of our I's were dotted and T's were crossed, um, taking our protocols from the hospital in terms of our multimodal pain management, um, you know, it, intraoperative medications, postoperative, things of this nature. Um, our therapy, uh, we planned our physical therapist. We have two offices that are within a couple of miles of our surgery center. And so our, we had a couple of our therapists that were gonna come over for our first couple of total joints and show the staff and safely show them how to do therapy with a belt. Um, we had stairs brought that we bought for our facility um, as part of some of our capital expense. So the patients could do uh, stairs um, and they could do that safely and teach the staff as well as we had to get our surgical hoods as well as drills um, 
as well as make sure our C arm uh, was capable of doing this. And then as well, a HANA table, and you know, as a large capital expense coming in, that is a big purchase. And, you know, and, but it's, it's, it's valuable. All of us here are HANA table believers and users. So that had to be part of it. So thinking about that and uh, planning about how are we going to get a HANA table? Do we buy it? Do we rent it? What do we do? And so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, part of this was patient selection. Um, so one was finding a patient with Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, but also the right patient. You know, the first couple, uh, you know, we're shooting for a BMI less than 30, uh, no diabetes, um, no uh, opioid use uh, currently and was a non-smoker and a right patient uh, with the right insurance. You know, do we do a total knee or a total hip? Um, and the thought was a total knee because we wouldn't need CR and we wouldn't need a HANA table. Um, uh, we felt that that would probably be our best thing. The other thing we did is while we were waiting for the insurance, we practiced. We had multiple dry runs. We had multiple meetings with our teams, not only our surgery schedulers from the office, but everybody at the surgery center uh, would meet uh, kind of every other week, making sure everybody had their parts down. Then we would have a day where we'd imitate a patient coming in, what would be the flow. Uh, we would run through the instrumentation. It was kind of like being uh, a resident again, where that you just practice in your head and everybody would you know, learn the steps what I would do because everybody that helped me in surgery, they've never done a total joint in the hospital other than if they work there other, but they'd never done one with me. So what I like, and then also the plannings of what if, you know, what happens? You don't have the backups that you would in a hospital setting just from a storage and a prep, but you not, you know, if there's an intraoperative fracture, was our, you know, do we have cables? Do we have uh, cup options in case it was to, dislocate or not be stable and just making sure our equipment reps had kind of all the stuff ready and everything processed beforehand. Um, and so those were all of our things that we did. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So after all that, ironically, our first was a total hip. Um, and it was one of the husbands of one of the ladies that works in our billing department at the surgery center. And he met the criteria um, and with her insurance, she knew how much it would save and she requested that he be done there, which was great because then we didn't have to kind of force the issue and he was on board. Um, and this was done in August of 2020. Um, it was, uh, we had, they loaned us the HANA table for this one uh, case, which was great. We had it on loan just for trial for two weeks. Um, and it, surgery, my operative time for an anterior total hip is about 45 minutes skin to skin. Um, his total time at the center was four hours um, and it was really great. He has done amazing. Um, he actually replaced all the windows in my house about three months ago, climbing up ladders. He is an amazing guy. So he, it, his experience was great. Um, uh, it, it was uh, the perfect patient to do. Our second was a total knee in September of 2020. Once again, I do a press fit knee. My operative time was about 40 minutes. Um, and total time at the center was four hours for him to um, just did really well. Experience was good. Uh, the team was getting comfortable. Since then, we've done nine total knees. Um, our average profit after cost is about $9,000. So, next slide. So, kind of in the future, you know, right now, as of a couple of months ago, all insurance plans other than Medicare are open to that. Um, and so now that kind of opens our door to be able to do more totals uh, there. Um, we're also looking at kind of controlling that with uh, TOA doing total joint bundles with insurances or companies, uh, giving target prices and controlling costs uh, to encourage this more. Uh, we're actually in the process of buying our own HANA table as we are buying an updated larger uh, C arm that's going to be better for our totals so we can do more uh, improved imaging. Um, and that's kind of where we're looking at, but that has been 
my experience, uh, which has only been positive, um, the patient's experience have been positive. And so we're going to build on that and see how we can push that in the future. Um, final slide. Um, and feel free if I can be helpful to anybody with protocols, kind of my thoughts and experiences and to go into depth, feel free to reach out to me on my email on the screen or my cell phone. I take texts. Uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, about this and, and give our experience and kind of what we've done and how we've done it. Um, it's a small number and we're early, but our experience has been great um, in a multi-specialty center uh, without problems up to this point. But thank you very much. I appreciate your all's uh, attention. I'm gonna pass the microphone to Dr. Hawk uh, to talk about his uh, uh, neurosurgical slash spine experience in the surgery centers. Thanks so much. My name is Mahir Hawk. I'm a orthopedic spine surgeon at Spine Group Orlando Celebration Orthopedics. And I'm here today to give you a kind of presentation on my experience with ambulatory spine surgery. I have a few disclosures. Some are relevant to this presentation. One, I am a shareholder in two different surgery centers in Florida. One Sand Lake Surgery Center is a joint venture with um, SCA. And the other Celebration Surgery Center we're building without a um, uh, current management company involved. I do some device development, but none of it is relevant to this presentation. So by way of background, when I graduated from my fellowship in 2015, um, I did start immediately doing ambulatory spine surgery. I did come into a, an area with a, um, with a uh, surgery center where they were already performing spine surgeries on an outpatient basis. And over the course of my career, over the last few years, I have done more and more to the point where my group is actually building our own surgery center. And so I'm gonna be involved both in a mature program and in a nascent program, uh, which we will soon to be launched, soon launch. Um, but because I had begun right out of fellowship to do spine surgery on an outpatient basis, uh, I did come up, so to speak, with uh, an idea of what was safe and what was not safe and how to proceed best practices early in my career as such that I didn't really have too much timidity about doing ambulatory spine surgery right off the bat. Um, important, importantly, there is really quite good evidence that ambulatory spine surgery, when done on the right patient for the right reasons, can be safe and can certainly be a, a great value um, so this is one of the, uh, one, one of the foremost papers. Uh, it's a literature review out of Frank Phillips's group, Rush, where they basically looked at both ACDFs and microdiscectomies, and they showed that, um, both, uh, ambulatory ACDFs and microdiscectomies are, uh, an overall cost savings for the, uh, patient and for the surgery center, as well as, they are safe and we can demonstrate that there are improved outcomes. There are a number of other articles, but just for a matter of perspective in uh, this one series, microdiscectomy was an average of about 24,000 when done at a hospital versus 11,000 when done at a surgery center. And um, ACDF was about a 50% savings as well. So certainly there is some value to our society. And um, as Dr. Rose was saying, there can be through gain share of value to surgeons in order to um, make sure that we perform best practices and try to do the appropriate surgeries in the appropriate um, venue. Now, there are, as I said, a number of other studies, but just a couple of highlights. There's about a 50%, 58% lower morbidity and an 80% lower return to OR with outpatient ACDFs versus inpatient. ACDFs, and if you use a four-hour PACU window, um, as is the protocol at Rush University, there's about a 0.8% hospital transfer rate. So it's an acceptable hospital transfer rate with an equal 90-day 90 90 morbidity for outpatient versus inpatient cases. So certainly there is evidence for safety for a number of procedures, specifically uh, the literature does support very robustly ACDFs and microdiscectomies, but also for 
cervical disc replacements, cervical decompression surgeries, lumbar decompression surgeries, SI fusions. But I, I do feel compelled to um, share that maybe not all cases are safe and effective or maybe even appropriately done um, in an ambulatory surgery center. There is, is certainly a um, responsibility of the surgeon to choose proper patients and um, in the patient to understand what it means to have an ambulatory um, surgery. So in this respect, the spine surgery experience is quite similar to the joint replacement experience that Dr. Rose spoke of. You really do have to have everybody on board. Therefore, it really is a, um, it's important to choose the right patient, what we call the ideal patient. A person has a BMI of less than 30, non-smoker, not diabetic, female comorbidities, ASA one or two, they're not on blood thinners. And I like to say, there's a sniff test. You, you really, when you meet a person, you can understand whether or not uh, they are likely to succeed uh, with an outpatient surgery or if they're likely to require a hospital stay. And you, as long as you, you do kind of abide by those, it can be a, a rather successful program. Um, now, at the same time, surgeons need to be a little bit introspective. Surgeons need to select themselves. If your cases take less than two hours, then you probably can do really well with outpatient spine surgery. But if you do larger cases and, and you simply can't really meet that goal of about two hours where morbidity um, increases, then maybe you shouldn't be doing cases there. Um, but nonetheless, outpatient spine surgery does have improved outcomes. Um, this this study showed that there has uh, been an increase, a trend, not just to ambulatory microdiscectomies, but to um, hospital-based outpatient microdiscectomies steadily over the past two decades, to the point where in 2014, 68% of microdiscectomies were done as an outpatient at a hospital, whereas um, for the ambulatory basis, 10.6% of microdiscectomies overall were done at an ambulatory care center, and that was in 2014. The um, data has only shifted further in that direction since. So I'd like to speak to our experience with ASCs. Um, we do have two, one that we own part of and another that we primarily own. Um, so the first one that I began to operate in was a multi-specialty ASC, which is managed by Sand Lake Surgery Center, uh, by um, SCA, which is called Sand Lake Surgery Center. And um, in that surgery center, they were already doing outpatient ambulatory spine surgeries. Um, our new venture is primarily orthopedics, 70%. Uh, so there are a couple of important things to know about Florida. Up until a couple years ago, Florida didn't have 23 hour ob observation stays. So patients had to leave by midnight. And uh, that was something which changed recently and has really opened the doors to our ability to perform ambulatory spine surgeries because now we have the 23 hour observation. And Florida is not a state where you need a certificate of need. So um, this was kind of understood, but then that was affirmed in 2019 that the state did not require one. That makes it easier for surgeons in Florida to pursue an outpatient spine surgery program. So when setting up a program, you really do need a comprehensive program. It does require surgeon leadership, just like Dr. Rose was speaking of, um, but also the nurses need to be on board, staff needs to be on board, and you need to have the proper uh, protocols for anesthesia and for um, early recovery, the ERAS protocols, so that you can have good outcomes and on a uh, repeatable basis. In our experience, it is important to use um, judiciously ketamine and magnesium sulfate intra-op in order to modulate the, the opiates that we give. We give Toradol if it's okay with the surgeon um, post-operatively. And as well, we give intra-op Decadron and, and Marcane. We don't really use Expirel that frequently because our experience with Marcane, um, sometimes with epinephrine is quite good. When you are designing a spine surgery program for ambulatory surgery, it's important to understand that this is something that you do need to put in a certain amount of capital expense to achieve. Um, just like with the joint surgeries, we have specific tables 
for spine surgery, which allow the surgeries to be more efficient and also safer with lower blood loss. So um, that is an important thing to try to acquire. This is a Jackson table with a couple of different variations, whether you're decompressing or fusing a patient. Um, but it's important to understand that you do need to have larger autoclaves, just like with the joint trays, the spine trays can be pretty large. You need to have a lot of space to, to store things like the extra tables you might acquire. You need specific retractors, burrs, microscope, sometimes even spine navigation. And these can be large capital expenses. Um, but if you have enough volume, then you can certainly support that. On the contract side, you need carve outs for hardware because these procedures do use significant um, amounts of implants and uh, you need to make sure that your, your contracts will support that. It's important to understand that ambulatory spine surgery is not just a one-way road. So while I said in, in ACDF studies, it's about 0.8% um, rate of transfer to a hospital, some studies do show up to a 5% rate of transfer to a hospital. That hasn't been my experience, but it, you will, um, it, you have to be aware that there needs to be a relationship with a local hospital in case a patient needs to be admitted. Most commonly it's for pain control reasons. Um, but again, if you choose the right patient and, and you have open communication with the patient, then that is certainly the exception. It's important also to understand that complications do happen. So we need to be prepared in order to mitigate risks. Um, just like total hips have unique complications like fractures, uh, spine surgeries have unique complications like hematomas. And one particular type of hematoma that we do worry about is the anterior cervical hematoma. The anterior cervical hematoma can cause airway compromise. So we do have a literature basis to know which patients are at risk for those hematomas on a pre-op basis, but post-operatively in, um, in a part of your program, you need to have nurses that are trained to manage, to identify and work with the anesthesiologists or work with the surgeons in order to uh, manage if there is an anterior cervical hematoma. Other complications that might occur and that everybody needs to be um, educated in would be C5 nerve palsies, which are typically re relatively benign and self-resolving, or Horner, Horner syndrome, which sometimes happens with anterior cervical surgeries. It does look like a stroke. You have weakness um, on one side of the face, and so, nurses need to understand that sometimes if there's um, prolonged retraction in the anterior neck, you can get um, a Horner syndrome from a sympathetic um, palsy. So the most specific uh, complication that is rarely seen, but very important for you to know how to manage in your ambulatory um, surgery program would be the anterior cervical hematoma. This can, as I said, lead to airway compromise. So the ways that we prevent these are with placements of drains. So we place a drain anytime we do a Smith-Robinson approach. But when you place the drain, you need to know, uh, everybody needs to know who removes the drain, when the drain gets removed, when the drain doesn't get removed. And if the drain is removed or if the drain isn't functioning, if a hematoma develops, what do you do? Um, we have protocols for that. So there's the no scare protocol, which basically says if you've extubated, the person develops an anterior cervical hematoma, you can attempt to re-intubate if there's any airway compromise. If that fails, then you have to remove the stitches in the front of the neck and manually evacuate any hematoma that might be there. You can try to re-intubate then. If you fail, then you have to do a, cricothy a cricothyroidotomy. We, none of us want to see this, but we all have to be ready to manage something like this. And uh, as a part of our spine surgery program, we've made sure that everybody's educated in, in the no scare protocol. Lastly, there has to be some um, discussion and some normalization about what your observation is. So it is acceptable uh, from, that pa from the papers that are rushed, we know it's acceptable to do a four hour PACU window, but some people prefer a 23 hour observation for all anterior cervical surgeries. So these decisions need to be made ahead of time and um, that will give patients the confidence that they don't really have anything to worry about. So I just wanna go over there, quite a few different types of techniques that might be amenable to ambulatory surgery. Um, 
both minimally invasive and traditional techniques. So as I said, it's very important as a spine surgeon to know your own limitations, to understand who's the right person for ambulatory spine surgery. And one of my early um, attendings was uh, formerly a carpenter. So I've got lots of carpenter analogies, but basically patients like this might make the hammer meet the fingernail as opposed to meeting the, uh, the nail. And so it's important just to, to be honest and, and to do your due diligence and your pre-op planning and to do the right surgery in the right place for the right reason. We do have minimally invasive spine surgery techniques, which we are uh, increasingly using. The main tenets are to minimize local soft tissue injury, which provides, we think, and we've seen earlier recoveries. And most importantly, we've demonstrated that long-term results are equivalent, if not superior, with minimally invasive spine surgeries. There are plenty of different types. There are endoscopic approaches, MISD compressions, MRS fusions. We have cervical disc replacements. And um, so one of my particular favorite approaches of outpatient spine surgery in the ambulatory care center is endoscopic spine surgery. We do uh, what are called paralateral approaches or posterior interlaminar approaches. And you can also do cervical endoscopic discectomy. The paralateral approaches go through Kamen's triangle we uh, navigate between the exiting and the traversing nerve roots, take out part of the superior articular process, and, and we can get to the disc. This is a procedure that traditionally is done under sedation. I do these with patients semi-awake, um, which provides for a quick recovery. And this is one of my cases where we had a gentleman with a degenerative scoliosis, but he had a monoradiculopathy in his right leg due to a disc osteophyte complex out here. And so I was able to do an endoscopic discectomy on him. And this is looking through the endoscope at his uh, traversing nerve. That patient did quite well. He was 80 years old. He got up the same day, went home, and he didn't have to have a large scoliosis surgery. Um, ACDS, anterior cervical discectomy infusions, like I spoke of, are very safe to do in an ambulatory surgery center, as long as you have a program that will sustain them. This was a single level ACF at C67. You can also do cervical disc arthroplasties, disc replacements at the surgery center. And one, one of the cool things about cervical surgery for the people in the operating theater is uh, we oftentimes use microscopes. And so for the microscope, the whole um, room can see what we're doing. So this was, this was me taking out a disc herniation and then taking out a bridging osteophyte right next to that disc herniation. Um, so it's, it's involving the, the people in, in the operating room can be involved in the procedure. We also do translomartin body fusions, T-lifts. There are both awake techniques. I've done awake surgeries with patients under sedation. That's a great technique for people that have spondylolisthesis um, who are older, and I wanna to try to avoid general anesthesia for. And then there are more traditional uh, minimally invasive interbody fusion techniques. You can do SI fusions sacroiliac fusions, and um, you can do lateral interbody fusions. So more recently in our program, we've started to do lateral interbody fusions, and it's important to understand our earlier cases were more like the case on the left than on the case on the right, but both of these patients were 23-hour ops, and um, both had great outcomes. So simply put, ambulatory spine surgery is, is great for the surgeon, it's great for the patients, as long as you stick to best practices and you understand the limitations of your um, practice as a surgeon. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for today. I wanna to thank Monica, Dr. Rose, and Dr. Hawk for your time and insights and Mizuhu OSI for sponsoring today's session. And to our attendees who joined us, Thank you for making time to be a part of our Becker Spine Orthopedic and Pain Management-Driven ASC Virtual Conference. We look forward to seeing you at future Becker's events.